All right, greetings from the dark continent. Conscious Caracol here, or Adams Van Sale, here to shine a light on some stories from the southern tip of Africa. And here to join me is a, a face that I think some of my audience might have rec might recognize, and that is Rory Duncan. It's not the first time that he's been a guest on the show. The previous episode was about how Mr. Duncan just stumbled into the R Rwandan genocide, you know, as you do. Um, but uh, that's a story where, that you can listen to after tonight's episode. If you did miss it, it's on my channel. You can just search uh, Conscious Caracal, Hearts of Darkness, the Rwandan Genocide. Um, this episode, however, is about a different topic. Tonight's episode is about hunting dangerous men in the African wilderness. And uh, this is, we're not speaking metaphorically. This is real, real world stuff. And um, Mr. Duncan is going to tell us a bit more about that. But Rory, first of all, how are you doing? Good and uh, even better just to see you. Um, I'm a great supporter of yours and, and the work that you and your organization do. So it's an absolute privilege to be here. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, spinning a yarn, as the Australians would say. <laughs> Right. And before we get into the exciting stories of your past, I just want to lay the foundation for the audience there. What are you doing today? I know you're there in the Karua Desert. You love that uh, scenery. You always post pictures there. Uh, what's life like uh, in the in the Karua Desert uh, these days? You know, since leaving uh, Zim 10 years ago, um, I've been a bit of a gypsy. I've lived in uh, Gauteng, Northwest, KZN, Free State, Lesotho, and finally found uh, 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 the Karoo, uh, which just feels like home to me. And uh, so we're very, very happy here and uh, very fortunate to have gathered um, knowledge in the natural plant and natural medicine field, the botanical and nutraceutical industry, they call it. And uh, so we're busy with uh, farming a, a little fit plant, a little succulent from the clan Karoo called uh, Skeletium. And uh, we're processing medicines out of that, or if you like, uh, supplements out of that, that work towards uh, fighting depression and uh, uh, drug abuse uh, and uh, addiction and things like that. So we're very, very busy with that. And um, I've got a great bunch of partners. We've got an operating lab and a manufacturing lab in Oetzwaren. And uh, yeah, couldn't be happier. It's, it's a great place. It's, it's unusual. The sun goes down sometimes at nine o'clock. Uh, doesn't rain sometimes for about a hundred days, but uh, otherwise, yeah, it's it's wonderful, man. Hmm. So before we get into the first story, uh, our first one, I think you on, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure you answered this question in the previous stream as well. But just for those in the audience that don't know, what is your connection to Zimbabwe? I mean, our story tonight is going to take us there, but uh, what's your and your family's personal connection to that part of the of the dark continent? So we were South African based um, Afrikaners, 50% uh, and, and, and Engelsman, English speaking uh, South Africans. And um, in about uh, 1885, um, our people started to move northwards uh, from the Cape area um, and uh, eventually ended up joining Rhodes's column uh, into Mashonaland. Uh, so my great great grandfather, uh, Sandy Tullach, uh, was a gunner. He had a stallion and a chariot with a Gatling gun on it, and uh, they moved up with uh, with the what they call the Pioneer Column into uh, Mashonaland. Uh, and then my great great grandfather uh, went walking off uh, into the eastern districts uh, to what is today the Mozambique border area, and he began to pan for gold there, and eventually um, settled there and uh, opened a mine, which is still going today, Red Wing Mine in Penalonga. And uh, our family farm was there uh, until the government took it uh, not too long ago. Uh, so we have a very long history, as long as white people have ever been in that part of the world, save for the early explorers and uh, hunters. And so, yeah, it's, it's a very tight uh, relationship. We are the founding settlers, as uh, some people like to call us. 
Hmm. It's a fascinating yeah. history there. Um, but I mean, we can always do another stream on another day, specifically just about Rhodesia slash Zimbabwe's uh, history. And I think that would be just as fascinating. But uh, tonight's uh, tonight's episode is specifically about your, your history as a, a man hunter. Um, but firstly, I'm, I'm very curious, where, how did you get into that industry? How do you get into that field of work? And how, where do you accumulate the expertise to, to be able to do such a thing? Yeah, so, I mean, I was born in 1966, uh, so I'm 57 years old now. And, you know, the war in our country started in, in 1965. Mm. So from 1965 till 1980, I, the first 14 years of my life was living in a war. And uh, because of that, we, uh, and being from farming stock, uh, we were either conservationists, miners, or farmers in our family. And as a result, we were always rural based and uh, because of that uh, we were highly trained in the use of uh, firearms and tactics and self-defense um, and tracking what to do well. in emergencies oh yeah you, you name it hunting tracking um, you know it was a very different world back then it was super analog and uh, so you started training kids at a very early age to be self-sufficient and 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 aware so that was the beginning of it and then um as it turned out, um, uh, my family were in conservation and my mother's brother, Glenn Tatham, who was a very, very famous uh, African conservationist, uh, particularly in the fight against the disappearance eventually of the black rhinos in Zimbabwe uh, with a focus on the Zambezi Valley. And that was um, a, um, a, a war, a real war. I mean, we had... Um, American uh, special forces, British special forces there. And uh, because he was the chief warden, my uncle, um, uh, I, I was seconded uh, along with my cousins uh, into the operational areas uh, many, many times. And uh, as a result, we were used to carrying weapons and we were used to uh, dealing with uh, the threat of contact and contact itself. Uh, so being and, and growing up as well, of course, around soldiers and special forces soldiers, so the SAS guys, the Salu Scout guys, uh, the elite tracking units, um, uh, it, it rubs off on you. And uh, then, of course, uh, just my love for the bush itself. Eventually, um, in the 84, 89, 84, early 1985, uh, after independence, uh, I finished school in 83, I think. <laughs> Can't remember, it's a, a while ago now. <laughs> but um, but uh, then I, I moved immediately to uh, a place called Chimani Mani, which is a, a magnificently beautiful area on the far eastern, the most eastern uh, s uh, section of Zimbabwe. And there you have this majestic mountain range across between the Swartberg and the Drakensberg, I suppose, for South African context, uh, but with much, much higher rainfall. So you have a, a 3,000 millimeters a year. Um, and uh, the topography and the, the geology is, is very much formed by that extreme weather. You, you have in the lower valleys and the, and the deep crevices, you have uh, genuine rainforest uh, with gaboon vipers and blue dikers and green mambas and some mango monkeys. And uh, then uh, within, you know, uh, a very short uh, space, you have a 5,000 foot uh, cliff face, which takes you into montane grasslands and uh, where you have sable and eland and uh, black eagles and tighter falcons. So one of the most wonderful natural habitats. And of course, uh, living there and having the freedom that we had after the war, I was able to then walk uh, the bush to my heart's content and being young and super fit, um, I made it a speciality. And uh, eventually I started guiding uh, because my knowledge of the area was so extensive. I started guiding people uh, and the early people that came were National Geographic, um, the Belgian Zoological Society, um, uh, people wanting to really explore the uh, the, the University of New South Wales, looking for things like uh, uh, cycads, uh, looking for things like uh, the nomadic hunters that were still operating on the Mozambican complex. And then that eventually led, led uh, to me 
uh, being employed by the British Army uh, and the Italians in those days, uh, it wasn't the EU. Uh, so two, three, four uh, militaries uh, employed me uh, in a formal uh, contract with the knowledge of the government uh, to do what they call um, venture training programs with those soldiers. So they would set me up with 10 of their elite guys and say, right, you're, uh, in, you're in pursuit or you're being pursued. And uh, then they would let me at it. And then I would take those guys on extreme uh, foot expeditions, uh, 12 to 16 days unsupported, just with backpacks. Um, and uh, yeah, so, you know, it, it developed from there. And um, all that while, so I was gathering information on what was happening within that, that area. And it's a very big place. I mean, you're talking about or probably uh, 50, 60, 60 kilometers in width by 180, 200 kilometers in uh, north to south. And, um, and uh, then into a lowlands that was largely forest and uninhabited. And uh, with the, 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 the 25 year civil war in Mozambique, um, and which was raging at that time, uh, obviously in those places was where you had your Renamo bandits and uh, others called the Mutsangas, these uh, groups of rebels uh, that would hide out in these mountain places and in those forests. And then they would commit attacks and atrocities on villages and against the government, which uh, which uh, they were vehemently uh, against. And uh, But occasionally they would come across into Zimbabwe for easy pickings and raid uh, trading stores and stock buses and things like that. And so it started getting out of hand. I mean, I can tell you that uh, I remember sitting in the early evenings, we had this beautiful staircase that looked over a view that only the angels could have created and uh, listening into the valley uh, below, which is the border to Mozambique and literally listening to the war, you know, pa, 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 pa. And uh, with all that considered, so um, uh, I was then uh, asked by uh, my uncle to take an expedition with a former SAS uh, officer, Tora Balance, and walk him through that area. We went for a couple of weeks uh, and uh, we walked uh, through and I sent you a, a letter uh, written there, which I, I, I posted mm. to you on WhatsApp. Uh, and that report then uh, was the um, motivation uh, to the government through my uncle who sat on the joint uh, jo uh, uh, jock committee, joint operational command uh, of the Zimbabwe defense structures. And uh, that's where he then got permission for me to um, get sent uh, uh, three, three operators, three wonderful black guys uh, and expert soldiers. And uh, that's how it all began. Mm. And this is now specifically, uh, you mentioned two... Um two names of uh, particular uh, dangerous men that you are hunting the, the the one man this is now the lead up to uh, your hunt for Simon Kumbi is that correct yes indeed hmm. so so if you can imagine Ernst, uh, in those days we were walking uh, 2000 kilometers a year <laughs> um, with heavy backpacks and military weapons and camping out in caves uh, you know, and uh, in the forests. Um, and we were in a place called the Haroni Gorge, which is one of those super low rainforest areas, uh, red mahoganies, gaboon vipers, like I said. And uh, we found a little cave um, next to the river. And uh, we noticed, of course, that there'd been some activity there. Um, uh, you know, fire remains and, and, and so on. And I was lying down on my roll mat, looking into the ceiling of the cave. And there was this very strange little, about 20, 30 centimeters long, this like snake-like thing sticking into the wall of the cave and coming out uh, into, into the cave. Uh, and I, I went up to it and it was, it was the horns of blue dikers. Hmm. Now, a blue diker is about the size of a rabbit. A small rabbit. It's one of the shyest, most rare things. You get them around Durban, actually. Anyhow, those things, uh, they, they, and it was the 
horns of 15 animals. They have little miniature horns and the, the hunters had been killing them and placing their horns together in in, in a, a long... Almost like I would go as far as to call it a little micro antelope. It's a micro antelope indeed. Yeah. And like a bush Lego, they built this funny snake and left it in there. And every time they hunted through there, they would obviously add one too. And I, and that, that really shocked me. And I thought, goodness me, I have not seen anything like that before. And so we started to concentrate on trying to find who was doing that. And um, it, that was the, the beginning of about a year long hunt for, for these guys. And um, it took, it took, as I say, a year and it took a lot of patience. We would sit in an observation point, an OP, um, uh, four of us. Uh, we would uh, keep 24 hour watch on, on certain spots where we knew that people would have to funnel through or where we knew that they'd stayed. And at points during the time uh, we seeking this guy out, uh, we actually knew that he was in a particular place and we had eyes on them. And what we'd do is we would sit perhaps three, four kilometers away, looking across the valley or down a gorge at them. And then two of us would break off and, and do a huge loop and come in and try to look at them a little more closely. So they'd go away for two days and then really sneak up to, to have uh, more information on and, and get eyes on them. And uh, we did that uh, multiple times uh, in both in the highlands and in the lowland forests. And uh, when we set our attack that we would be there at five the next morning, we would get them. Those guys would be gone. Hmm. And but just Lori, excuse me, before you continue, just for context, because I want people to understand the, the gravity of the situation. This isn't just a situation where you uh, you catch these guys and then they put their hands up and say, you got me. This is, these men are heavily armed and the potential for them to engage you if you were to, to corner them is very high, correct? Absolutely. It's uh, life and death. And uh, those guys uh, had been in the bush uh, for about... Uh, 20 years. So that was their habitat. And uh, they, they actually also came from the villages closest to there. So they knew it like the back of their hand and they were armed with uh, uh, Chinese weapons, uh, Russian weapons, SKSs, AKs, RPDs. Um, and yeah, they were certainly dangerous and armed and extremely skeptical and uh, totally in tune with their environment. Um, it's quite strange because we always used to say, if you capture those guys, turn them immediately into conservationists because uh, no one else would ever get in there to, to, to repeat what they did. Mm. But it wasn't just the conservation aspect, you know, it's the, it was the human count uh, because of the, the, the death and the attacks on both Mozambican civilians and civilian infrastructure, as well as the raids into Zimbabwe. So it was imperative that we caught them. And uh, so that hunt went went on and on. And, and during the course of those times, uh, that time hunting Simon Kumbi, of course, I didn't know his name until I caught him, but um, hunting him, uh, you know, took me uh, a year and uh, at least two 2,000 kilometers of walking and uh, probably at least uh, 150 days in the field. Um, we came across multiple groups uh, up to various levels of nefarious uh, intent. Um, for example, we would sit at uh, mountain caves and observe huge highland plains where your range of view is 60 kilometers, uh, you know, north to south and, and endless into the distance. And uh, we would just lie up and watch. And uh, so from time to time, you'll see, oh, here we go. And then it's maybe a bunch of 10, 15 uh, guys uh, with sacks, loaded, huge sacks. Uh, I don't know if anyone has been to Mozambique or Zambia where you'd see how they take a normal poly sack and then they build a, a weave of baobab bark to, to sort of double the capacity. And those things end up at about 50 kilos. And uh, so we would catch guys like that or, or observe groups like that. Um, and mostly it was uh, Dacha, 
you know, uh, growing it in the lowlands, walking it across into Zimbabwe, getting it on a, a long distance bus, getting it all the way to the capital city and, uh, and selling it on like that. So it was an industry and those guys, we would catch them, but there, there's no way. Could you, can you just get that dog Billy of mine out of here? <laughs> Sorry. That's He's fun. a rambunctious boy. He ate my shoes the other day. Ah. Yeah, so um, so those guys, we, we would capture them, without a doubt, and um, escort them back to Zimbabwe, <clears throat> sometimes uh, on a, well, off, every time on a multiple-day hike. Uh, to give you an example, you would start the, a walk, uh, uh, you know, at, um, at a thousand feet above sea level. You would end up... Uh, at the end of day two at uh, 2,400 feet above sea level. You would then cross two mountain ranges, which would take you three days. Uh, and then you're in the operational area, maybe four days before you're in the operational area. And then you'd have, if you, if you engaged, you'd have to, you know, capture those people and then bring them safely back. And so, you know, four guys, 15 <laughs> guys captive, um, yeah, it was a challenge, but but guys, people doing that sort of thing, we we knew, you know. It was remember that it was just me and, and four, uh, three black guys, uh, two Shona speakers, two Shona guys, my Shona guys, one Matebele guy. You won't believe their names, Elijah and Elisha, <laughs> and Sergeant Bernard Zunze, wonderful human beings wonderful human beings that's where i learned i thought i knew a bit those guys taught me everything so yeah we went uh, we would catch those guys and then do the tedious trek back to uh, the base camp and then turn them over to law enforcement but quite but often all the, with all the while your main targets are still out there they're out there you know so it's a bit of a schlep so we developed a, a very um, a compassionate view to uh, the enemies that we faced or to the people that we encountered. So, for example, a group of uh, men um, carrying Dacha across the border was not something that we would uh, engage with, with any violence. And mostly we would walk them all the way there. So they had the terrible thought for three days that they're going to get caught, executed, you know, locked up, whatever. And then all we would do is uh, uh, let them surrender half of their stuff, you know, and then give them all a good bloody talking to and send them on the way all the way back and then warn them, this is no longer a place for you. Uh, you know, please don't come back. If you do, the next time the, the Shambok will grow a bit longer. So uh, those were very, very interesting times because we encountered all sorts of people. And one of the most interesting in that time was um, at a place uh, called uh, the Valley of the Wizards, believe it or not. Um, there was a giant cave, uh, a huge rock sitting above a waterfall called Tucker's Falls, which dropped 200 meters into a gorge. And there in the distance, Martin Falls dropping two, 300 meters into the same gorge. And then this cave mouth looked up a giant valley uh, which was a, a watershed and a collection of this river that became Tucker's Falls. And um, while looking up that valley uh, and sitting in that cave, well, actually, when we got to that cave, which, by the way, had been occupied by humans for eternity, it was most definitely a Bushman uh, regular home uh, in their pattern of life. And uh, so it had the paintings. Uh, it had dead litter of fine grass. It was the most beautiful place. And um, it was, although in the middle of one of the most dangerous places uh, in Africa at the time. So I'm sitting there with the binoculars and I'm looking up the river right to the top of the valley and I notice people there. But w when we arrived at the cave, we saw a whole lot of animal skins, uh, clay pots, some tin pots, very neatly rolled up and tucked way back into the back of the cave and a fire that would was used the day or the, uh, that that morning so we knew that there's some people out here but what we saw there was almost uh, stone age 
Um, it was skins and spears. Sure enough, uh, we eventually see the people coming. Uh, but they're far. We're talking about four kilometers, five kilometers from us. We're behind a huge uh, rock that, that protected the mouth of the cave. And they, they saw, when I first saw them with my 10 by 50 Bresser Optics German army <laughs> binoculars, they had seen me. And they, so they advanced very cautiously uh, about a kilometer and then about another kilometer. Eventually they were two kilometers out from me, one and a half kilometers out. And then I went, walked out and climbed this rock and I stood and, and beckoned them and said, come, come, it's fine, which they eventually did. And, um, and that, that was a, a life-changing moment. In fact, what's so interesting is that National Geographic had been up there with another wonderful guide called Howie Barnes, also a, a, a great soldier, and uh, how he had failed to encounter these people, but everyone knew that they existed, uh, but uh, just fortunately bumped into them. And, um, and so we spent uh, three days with those guys, and they were nomadic hunters, the last of the last of the, the, the real, if you like, wild, uh, natural African people. Um, and they were fascinating. Um, so we had a wonderful time with them. So there were multiple um, engagements that were very uh, fascinating. Uh, we made sure that we were not uh, out there to cause harm where harm did not uh, it was not required or where violence was not required. Then um, one fine day, we're in a place called the Haroni Gorge. And the base of that gorge um, is characterized by these uh, deep alluvial um, sedimentary deposits onto, on which grow uh, these beautiful kaya niacica trees, the red mahoganies and uh, wild figs and tamarinds and vines. And, and that's where you get your, your green mumbas and your gaboon vipers and the, your, your blue dikers and, uh, and so on there and crowned eagles. Um, and those little pockets of forest run for between anything for a half a kilometer to 500 to 20 meters to 60 meters. And they can vary in depth from 100 meters to 30 meters wide. So you and you have to constantly cross this very, very powerful, fast flowing river uh, because the path takes you to the cliff face and then you've got to cross the river and then you can walk in the forest again. So the forests are, are interspersed down the gorge like that. And uh, we were walking in formation, well, in, in single file. I was in the front um, and uh, the machine gunner, uh, Elijah, was at the back, the big Matebele guy uh, with uh, Sergeant Zunze and Elisha between us. And we were spaced around 10 meters apart um, and walking silently on what are essentially game paths. But this is the area that those little dike horns, I found the blue dike horns in that cave. And I stopped because I, I th there was a noise that I, I heard that I'd never heard in the forest before. And it was, it, it was a bird sound, but I'd never heard that bird before. And the thing people don't realize about the wilderness is that once, when you're in nature all the time, anything that's unnatural catches your eye. There's a you particular soundtrack that plays, and if they, and you're, it's like listening to the same music album over and over again, and then suddenly there's a new song, and you're like, "Whoa!" That and, yeah. I, 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 and it was a strange little tune, uh, and I turned to the guys, and I said, and we and we split. So I went ten meters into the jungle on on the left. And the next one to the right, next one to the left, next one to the right. So we were about 40 meters in a column, now split, two on either side. And sure enough, this bunch of guys, five of them, with their weapons over their shoulders, and this guy in front, a little sort of 40-year-old 40, 40 man, barefoot, and he walked straight past me and they all walked past me. And as soon as the last one had passed me, I walked back into the track 
and said, good afternoon, gentlemen, <laughs> which was certainly a sound they would never have heard before. <laughs> and uh, it was uh, obviously not a funny moment then, but uh, there was all sorts of pandemonium, but uh, we had them. We had them and uh, the machine gunner came out in front and then my other two guys around the sides and uh, we caught them. And that was Simon Kumbi. Hmm. And uh, Rory, it, before you continue, how long have you been looking for this man now by this point? A year. Yeah. yeah. It's insane. <laughs> and, and I only caught him by accident. Yeah. Might because have been another five years if it hadn't been for that encounter. Without a doubt. You're talking about an area, you know, like a quarter the size of Kruger or something. So yeah. the chance of banging into each other is almost zero. But we did. And you're, and you're, looking, for, you're looking not looking for, for men that are walking around in army boots that you can easily track. You're looking for men that are blended into the environment. Absolutely light on their feet. They counter track you. They um, set traps for you. I mean, I nearly had my right leg ripped off. Um, thank God they <clears throat> they knew we were after them. Hmm. Because even though we were fairly elite and fairly, you know, uh, good at what we were doing, we were good Bushmen, these guys are next level. So um, they would set traps and be ahead of us uh, three days and then disappear. Uh, but I, I got my right heel um, triggered a whip, uh, whip snare uh, and they would take a, a rainforest tree that's possibly 20 centimeters at the base and shimmy up it, two of them, until they could get it to come all the way down. There was no a rainforest tree uh, six meters uh, high and, 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 and whips like that with a, with a wire and it caught me around my boot, around my heel and just pulled my leg back and nearly over my shoulder. But thank God, my heel slipped out of the snare and I, I just got a slight strain. So they knew we were after them um, and uh, we bumped into them like that. And that's where the fun began because now you've got these guys and you're in uh, their environment and you don't know if there's others. Uh, you don't know whether the party is five or 10 or 20. They're not going to tell and you. <laughs> no, no. But uh, you know, we the first the first couple of days with them um, was very very intense. We had to keep them um, shackled at all times, and uh, the uh, only way we could do that was uh, to um, uh, handcuff them uh, around a tree, <laughs> you know, to each other, mm. and the poor buggers would have to sit like that overnight. And then uh, one by one, we would allow them to um, uh, wash our pots under under gun, uh, you know, under the barrel of a gun, or, or, or to cook uh, pup, or uh, to clean up. And uh, then when we started marching, uh, we had to march out of there, which is an incredible climb. It's uh, almost uh, it's almost three and a half. It's a kilometer vertical to yeah. get out of there. And um, and that takes uh, the best part of 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 of, of a day, uh, you know, maybe six seven hours march. Yeah, because you um, said you're in a gorge. We're in this place called the Haroni Gorge. Uh, I, I actually have the old one in fifty thousand maps in this old ca mm. case here um, of my of that time. So we walked them back out of the gorge, but away from the Zim border towards the Mozambique border. Uh, well, sorry, uh, uh, not towards the Zim border. You couldn't get out towards Zim there. You had to go back deeper into Mozambique. And um, so on day two, we caught them at about three in the afternoon. The next day, uh, we walked them up uh, into the highlands uh, at uh, 2,000 feet or so. Uh, uh, sorry, 2,000 meters uh, or so, excuse me. Um, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 feet. Um, I think the top of those mountains is about 8,500 feet. So we'd walked them up into a place called Dragon's Tooth and these amazing plains that are up there. And, um, and then I, I wanted to turn north and march uh, a, a couple of days north, and then we would eventually turn uh, west and, and climb the, the last range, which was the Zim border, 
and then drop down into the lowlands and the uh, park entrance and then um, hand them over. But um, when we made the turn north, uh, Kumbi, who, by the way, was uh, from a tribe called the Ndau, and the Ndau are a tribe that uh, exist both on the Zimbabwean and Mozambican side of the border. And uh, in just, just to give you a sort of an understanding of how uh, industrious and how adapted those folks were to their environment, um, the in to how adapted they were to the environment those guys would would um occupied a huge area of land called the uh, lucitu valley and they they were never under the control of the rhodesian army during the war the rhodesians tried went in there once and it was it was over <laughs> and they just decided okay well you know what we're just going to let those little forest guys carry on doing what they're doing and uh, then of course the defense perimeter moved back into Zimbabwe or Rhodesia at the time and they, they monitored that way but it was a very hot spot during the Rhodesian um, civil war um, then um, so and I was able to speak Ndau uh, at that time um, they have the most uh, wonderful language actually uh, just a greeting takes uh, quite a few minutes uh, how are you? Fine, thank you. How did you sleep? Good. How's the afternoon? Fine. And you? Yes, me too. I slept well. Thank you very much. Um, and, and they're just wonderful folks uh, in terms of being so attuned to their environment and such survivors. But as we turned north, Kumbi said to me, uh, why are we going that way? My place is this way. I said to him, well, what place, man? He said, no, I, I live here. You live here. Yes. I said, what? Your kumusha, your, your, your village, your home village is, it's where? Oh, no, my home village is there. He starts telling me the names Dombe and these places in Mozambique, which were war ravaged at that time. He said, that's my home area, but my village is just here. So I said, well, let's go to your village then. <laughs> And uh, we walked down behind Dragon's Tooth and through these high valleys. Uh, strangely enough, a place that maybe three years before I took, oh, no, so, sorry, later I took the university guys there looking for a, a rare cycad called Chimonimoniensis, which we never found. But uh, anyway, we walk and we follow this river and then it goes over a series of beautiful waterfalls and cascades into these little uh, highland valleys. Uh, sort of uh, forest and grass and then cascades again. And this guy had built himself an entire off-grid, self-sufficient village with wives and kids and pigs, goats, in, in the most wild place. And so I really, really, really was, was flummoxed because now it's not just these guys. But it's three women, children, a young teen boy, dogs. And the way that he positioned his village uh, there, he was the only inhabitant in, in thousands and thousands of square kilometers. Uh, but we couldn't allow that to continue. And so eventually, you know, in discussion with the team, we, we, we got to know him. And, and asked him, so, so where, where are you from and, and why are you here? We sat in his village. What, what are you doing here? He said, no, because of the war, me and my guys, we didn't want to fight anymore and kill people. So all we do is we provide meat and skins and we provide mushonga, you know, things for medicine like uh, uh, a, a paw of a leopard or a baboon hand or a spleen of a gaboon viper or whatever it is that you want to you know look at the, the, but killing really endangered species in order to do that and supplying meat and skins and they would go down uh, very tentatively once in a while with their sacks of dried meat and uh, their trade goods which were all just derived from that bush hunted out from that bush and that wilderness and then they would go down and then they would trade with the villages that still existed 
possibly about a 70 kilometer walk from where they were. So sadly, we burnt that village to the ground. But now we had these guys. And because we were together, all, all together, we were with them for, for six and a half days. And now we've gone from five to about 16, you know, with uh, women and children. Rory, before you continue, just the, for context, again, I think a lot for uh, maybe even people that just tuned in. Uh, why I'm, I'm uh, playing a bit of the devil's advocate for people that might not have the details, but why do you have to uh, burn down the village, take these people out of this area? What, uh, why can't they live there? Well, we'd, we'd been working with um, global interests in turning that area post the war into a transfrontier national park. And so where the Kruger is matched with the opposite park in Mozambique and the um, Zimbabwean park, Gonare and Zor, just to the north of it, that's all a transfrontier area. Uh, to allow larger and larger spaces for uh, the natural ecosystem of this part of the world to exist um, in, 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 in peace, you know, and, uh, and uh, so it's that. And then, of course, because of the armed conflict and the insurgencies uh, into Zimbabwe and then the war in Mozambique, it was our duty. Now, there's no way we could let a group of such skilled bushmen uh, to be armed with heavy caliber assault rifles uh, and and uh, continue to exist there. So there's absolutely no way that we could let them off of that. But as we spent, because we spent uh, five or six nights together um, having to camp out. And, and of course, we took, the, we took their weapons uh, and threw them uh, off a waterfall because we, we couldn't carry them uh, anymore. Uh, there was just no way. So we, we, we eventually uh, threw their guns away uh, and now we were, were we were so far south and and so much further into the dangerous territory that uh, we had to make a, a critical decision. But it was very very strange to develop a relationship with this guy Kumbi, and uh, we learned so much from him. You know, uh, where are uh, the bases of the Matangaise? Uh, it was a guy called Matanga. He was a crazy kind of warlord uh, that was a splinter of Renamo, uh, and he he controlled most of that district. Uh, then there were the Frolimo guys, of course, which was uh, Samora Michelle's people, and uh, then there were the Renamo uh, themselves, the resistance. Um, and uh, so we learned then uh, the, the true lay of the land and where these people's uh, boundaries were. Uh, and where the corridors were that people could move and and who was attacking what and who was alive still what is, is, are these people alive are they recruiting uh, what about these bandits who's attacking the people in Zimbabwe uh, where are they coming from and he just spilt the beans and not for fear of his life or out of guilt uh, or by any kind of uh, you know torture or any um, uh, coercion he uh, was just a fountain of of knowledge and he loved his family and he loved the people that he was with and he had caused quite a lot of environmental damage um, killing hundreds of animals uh, you know so yeah so we had to get rid of that but then we took a core decision that we were not going to kill them and then to walk all those people women and children all the way back to Zimbabwe and then hand over this family of people that partly were a part of the old order, or, you know, what would you call it, the Bronze Age, perhaps, I don't know, I'm not an a archaeologist, anthropologist, but people that are, are just completely have no connection with the modern world and then take them as armed insurgents into Zimbabwe and then have them processed by the law-making orphans of the children and causing mayhem in otherwise people that are traumatized beyond your imagination. You, you must know that in those times, uh, what the, the violence, there were no white people involved. Those wars, uh, you know, killed, uh, I think a million people died there, you know, 
um, and the atrocities, and of course the the, the atrocities, the absolute uh, disgusting behaviour, uh, the torture, the maiming, the forced cannibalism, uh, that type of thing was a common threat to the ordinary person caught in the middle of these warring factions. Um, and um, so we made a compassionate decision um, uh, to take them home, <laughs> which put us under enormous, enormous pressure because there's no way we could leave him up in the highlands, but we had to get him home. And so we said, all right, make a deal with you. You take us down there to your kumusha. Take us to your place and we will set you and your family free. But we've caught you once. <laughs> and the next time, if you come back up here, we'll, we'll, we'll kill you. Definitely, we'll shoot a lot of you. And, you know, he gave me such uh, convincing reassurance, Ernst. Where Kumbi said to me, um, I promise you, I have absolutely no intention. Because, remember, he didn't know what was going on further than his scope of, of operation. And so he never had, there was no radio, no news, no newspaper. The people that he dealt with were tribes people who were also surviving but closer to the action. And so he had no understanding of where the, the war was at. And I, I said to him, look, you know, um, uh, uh, Fre Limo has nearly won. Renamo Alfonso Tlacama, the, the leader of, of uh, Renamo, is in peace talks. Um, I think you can go home. I think it will be okay. And so uh, for a couple of days, we walked him and those people um, um, in a strange kind of somber procession into this war zone, um, having caught a guy that... that uh, was the most sneaky, talented um, Bushman I've ever met in my life. And uh, <clears throat> when he eventually said, okay, we're, we're getting near, uh, we stopped there and we spent the last evening there. And, um, and while that was uh, going on, we started to hear the village dogs in the distance. <coughs> oh, there's my dog. <laughs> Come on, Billy, you're not part of the show. Sorry, so yeah, so then uh, when we were close enough to literally smell the village fires, um, we said to him, all right, man, good luck. And we actually parted as not friends, but kind of with a, a strange bond. I just burned his, his paradise down and expelled him from, from his mountain hideout and took him back into the unknown, but back to his village and back to what remained of his people. Um, and I'm sure he was convinced that he should not return. And uh, so we let him go. And uh, and then we turned and we hightailed it. I'll tell you what, that was a long march. Uh, uh, it took us about six days to cap catch, catch him and deliver him six and a half, seven days to deliver him. And uh, I think we we walked uh, about uh, 45 Ks a day uh, for three or four days uh, to get to the Zim border and eventually uh, down the mountains and uh, for a cold beer in Shimani Mani village. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's how you want the story to end. Um, well, yeah, Rory, it's a, a fascinating part of not just the experience of living in Africa, but also of a certain time in the history of Africa where the continent is still a very chaotic and dangerous place today. But the world that you're describing is from a time where it was even more unstable. Uh, the, the, the dust was still in the air. At the, at the moment, the dust has settled to, uh, of some of these conflicts to a large extent. But uh, the world that you're describing is a world where it's still the clash between the old world and the new world. And some, some communities and individuals were of the old world clashing with, with the new one. And it wasn't, uh, wasn't always pretty, wasn't always fair. But that's a, 
that's the experience that I think any any part of the world goes through, whether that be in Europe at a certain time, in the Americas, in Africa, in Asia. It's the clashing of of an old world and a new world coming into being, and it's not it's not something that you can talk about in terms of well was it uh, the right thing or the wrong thing it, that's the core that's that's how history unfolded that's that's the the course that's the human story and what you're describing there is just a microcosm of the bigger human story it's a it's a chapter in in in, in africa's history where the best you can do is give us a little tiny shred of a glimpse into a time that i think most people today have have no comprehension of yes that's true um and and I'm not so sure um, it's better now. Um, clearly, it's better that the war has ended. Clearly, it's better that there's not, um, you know, um, death and mayhem. And, and, and it's good that there's not so many AK-47s and landmines and atrocities. So that's a super, super positive thing. But from a personal point of view, um, well, I was just fortunate to still see it when there were herds of of these black sable, mountain sable, and and eland. There were even buffalo there. You know, uh, it was such a such an incredible ecosystem. We would go to places, and I mean, I'll just tell you a for example. Hmm. The place doesn't exist anymore because of the Zimbabwean government and their incredibly greedy, terrible, disgusting environmental policies and just the, the free-for-all that uh, the, the ZANU made of, of, of that once amazing, prosperous country. But uh, in the same place that I caught Kumbi, possibly 40 kilometers south, still in that deep gorge, we crossed the river one day and, um, and I came up under a grove of Kayana Asika trees. This is called, a, 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 it's a mahogany, a red mahogany. Now, those things where they grow in the perfect environment, i.e. genuine rainforest uh, next to a river in a deep, dark forest, they grow to 60, 70, 80 meters tall. And they're so broad that you could drive a Jeep on them. Uh, a little bit reminiscent of the redwoods, but not that scale, but literally gigantic trees that would take 8, 10, 15 people to to put your arms around at the base, huge forest trees. And uh, underneath them, there was a, there were seven of them there, uh, and I marked it on the map. But, but when I came in under the canopy, you know, you're crossing a river like this with your backpack and rifle, and it <laughs> depends on the time of year. It's cold, it's freezing, uh, it's in a flood. Uh, but we came up under that canopy of those giant mahoganies, and, and I just stopped everybody and, and I thought I had moved, I'd walked into, um, what was his name, uh, from the heart of darkness. Oh, uh, Joseph Conrad. Yeah. What was the, 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 the main uh, chick character? Oh, Kirk. Uh, 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 Kurtz, yeah. Kurtz, it was a Kurtz, yes. Oh. I thought I'd walked into a place of human sacrifice. Because at the base of those mahoganies were skulls, Ernest. And I'm telling you, a hundred skulls lying all over in the leaf litter, some old and black, some relatively new. And it was haunting, I tell you. I, my skin went crazy. I thought, mm. what is this? I've never seen this before. But we figured out pretty quickly that it was an... Uh, a, a, a place that uh, crowned eagles had been nesting for centuries. And crowned eagles are some of the most amazing birds that have ever existed on the planet. They are the most powerful um, of the eagles in terms of their um, claw ability and strength of their claws. And they hunt eagles. They soar above the rainforest canopy. They watch samanga monkeys, baboons, and vervets mm -hmm. in the canopy. They stoop into the canopy, through the canopy, and then fly at 100, 150 k's an hour, smash a, a, a monkey and soar back out through the canopy, and then take it to their nest. And that was the result of 
uh, a couple of centuries of them nesting in the same place. So you can just imagine how pristine mm. that environment was. And so we saw it like that. But today, you know, it's gone. There was a place uh, um, um, called, um, uh, what was it called? This little forest, a beautiful little, it was, the, it was the last remaining lowland evergreen rainforest in Zimbabwe that was accessible by road. And I actually bought an old trading store there after that called Derera 4, and I wanted to convert it. Straight after the military pulled out, I bought that little store, and I wanted to convert it to a, a lodge and then get uh, bird watchers and conservationists from around the world to come and see that amazing place. And uh, Zanepf conflicted with me there because I brought in a grinding mill, a manual grinding mill, because the villagers had to walk uh, 20 kilometers to the nearest one. And uh, that was a service too far for them. I was gaining too much uh, uh, popularity amongst the people there. And what happened after that was that they came up with a special law that I was not allowed to be there because I wasn't a part of the tribe. And as a result of that, my conservation efforts with a famous conservationist now called um, uh, Gus Le Breton, you can see him on YouTube. He has a wonderful channel called uh, The African Plant Hunter. He's in a similar business to me now. And uh, he had a thing called Sapphire, the Southern Alliance for Indigenous Resources. Lovely guy, and he was a conservationist. He'd been doing these projects, saving these forests and things around Africa. And so I got him involved and handed it over to him, but to no avail. Eventually, they swapped me my store for a piece of ground, a, a, a residential plot in Chimaniwani village. And you know what they did, Ernst? They cut that forest down. Um, it had every representative, it's what they call a primordial or primeval or a remnant um, ecosystem. So it's from the time of the dinosaurs, it hasn't sort of changed. And they're just little pockets. And that was the furthest south that there was any lowland evergreen rainforest. And Zanapi have cut that down and built it into a community banana farm. So I'm not so sure the changing of the guard and the changing of the times, as you said, uh, was such a positive thing because the environmental damage uh, that has been done to that region and most of, of Zimbabwe now, you know, before they used to cure tobacco with coal, today they cure tobacco with trees that they cut on the farms that they've taken. And so there's a wasteland, the forest cover is gone. Um, and so on and so forth. So uh, I'm happy that uh, it's relatively peaceful, but boy, I do wish it had turned out with more empathy and more more pragmatism, you know. Hmm. Rory, I think the best course of action would be to have you back on for your second story. I think we've reached a very nice uh, little uh, uh, length of an episode for, for your first story. I think it would actually be a, a bit uh, excessive for some listeners to listen for two hours. I think another hour on another day would be better because um, I know a lot of my listeners are busy. They are already listening for an hour on a weeknight. I'm very, very grateful for that. And thank you very much Amen. for people that tuned in. But uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, I need to have you back for your second story. And that second story is about uh, Michael and Paul um, but uh, I'm not going to spoil too much about uh, that story. You can tell us uh, on the next time that I have you on, Rory. It will be somewhere this year. Um, it won't be next week, but I'll, I'll keep you up to date. Um, but thank you very much for your insights. I just have two comments here I wanted to uh, bring under your attention before we start wrapping up. Sideliner Opinions asks, what did you eat there in the bush? So we carried all our food. And um, you won't believe it, mostly we ate meat. Um, if uh, you go camping with a bunch of white guys, uh, you got baked beans and packets of pasta and, uh, you know, but uh, in those days uh, where it's real business, uh, we would take very few luxuries. Each of us would carry a big sack of pup and then each of us would carry a large bunch of fresh beef just cut into strips as if you were to make biltong. And then I used to use the old 35 mil film canisters and fill those with some spice and salt and what have you, a little bit of cooking oil. Uh, we used to take dried, sun-dried cab cabbage 
um, uh, which is is amazing as uh, survival food. Um, we would take uh, biscuits, some biscuits, uh, mostly boiled sweets, uh, lots of tea bags, uh, sugar, and um, and on the first night uh, we would eat fresh meat, and then we would create a little discreet fire with uh, green saplings over the fire, and then all that meat would be placed there and it would smoke overnight. And then in the morning we would put it back into the brown paper, roll it up, pack up our packs, and like that we could uh, survive uh, for at least 15 days, 20 days. And uh, then just to finish up on that question, um, we also used to carry forward and then in in areas we would stash um, uh, dry goods um, that, uh, you know, animals wouldn't be able to take away and we would place them in the back of a cave under rocks in a place that only we knew. Um, and that way we had sort of little resupply depots all over the mountains in two or three places. And the last comment I wanted to highlight was uh, from Jay, who says Rory should set up a militia and install himself as the benevolent dictator of the clan career. <laughs> you, you know, power goes to a man's head. Eh? Uh, <laughs> maybe but, uh, uh, maybe then you will be manhunted, Mr. Duncan. Absolutely. That would only take them a couple of days too, because I'm uh, not shy and I'm loud and I represent myself and my real name and I exist where I do and I'm proud of it and i'm proud of what we do and um, mm. i'm proud of you ernest and, and thank you very much for having me on the show again man mm. well thank you very much for coming to share your story rory as i said i'm I'll, i'm handing you a digital iou I, I i owe you another episode where we chat about your your second story and i see here the a lot of uh, people here at the end also commenting that they uh, found it fascinating and really uh, really enjoyed the show so rory thank you very much for your time thank you for sharing your wealth of experience and your stories i if at least i can use my platform to create a time capsule so that these stories are preserved for the future as long as the internet exists then uh, i'm very happy and uh, the bonus is people uh, were able to listen live as well and ask you questions yeah. and i can put their comments on screen but rory i hope you have an excellent rest of the week and then lastly also thank you for everyone that tuned in thank you for your comments and questions and um if you can uh, leave a like that helps out the show you can also if you're new to this uh, this channel and you like these types of conversations, you can le uh, you can subscribe. Uh, next week, I'm talking to, ironically, also someone with Duncan in their name. I'm talking to Duncan Rayburn, um, and we're going to be talking about uh, electricity and uh, living in the electrified era and how the the positive and negative, mostly negative, of uh, some of the effects that has had on humanity and and our psyches and people um, over the, right over, all over the world, but. Uh, tune in to, for that next week tuesday and uh, then also if you're watching and it's no longer live you can still take part in the conversation go leave a comment in the comment section i read all of them and i'm sure uh, mr duncan's also kind of come back maybe in a few days uh, to come check some of the so the comments there in the comment section as well so thank you very much once again rory i hope you have a great week and weekend stay safe and uh, to the rest of you all as well cheers have a good one and god bless Bye, Danke.